Hello and welcome to another Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler and today we'll be looking at horizontal asymptotes of exponential functions. I suspect that the word asymptote is probably a new term for you, and it's one that certainly if you go on and you study pre-calculus and calculus, you'll see quite a bit because it comes up a lot for various types of functions. So let's get right into it. Approaching the x-axis. All exponential functions of the form y equals a times b to the x approach the x-axis either as x approaches infinity or as x approaches negative infinity, depending on the value of b, of course. Let's take a look at this in exercise number one. Consider the function f of x equals 10 times 0.5 to the x. Answer the following questions. Letter A. State the value of each of the following. Use your calculator when needed. All right. Well, real quickly, before we do anything, pause the video and for a moment, figure out what f of zero is. All right. Well, as we know, f of zero is equal to the y-intercept. Give me just a moment. I just want to get my... So the y-intercept is equal to 10. And of course, we could actually plug, you know, zero in there, but 10 times 0 0.5 to the zero, any number to the zero is one, 10 times one gives us 10. Now, that being said, I wanna show you something, a little calculator technique that we saw very early in the course in unit one, but it's particularly helpful right here. Now, we're gonna eventually graph this function, so I'm gonna exit really quickly and open up my graphing calculator. I'm using the TI Inspire, and right now I have two windows open, one for calculation and one for graphing. And if I go over to the one for graphing, I'm gonna end up putting that, that function in right now. So I'm gonna just enter 10 times 0 0.5 raised to the x. And eventually we're going to get a proper window and sketch this function and whatnot. But for right now, I'm gonna go back over to my calculation screen. The cool thing is, as we pointed out in unit one, your graphing calculator, both the TI-8384 Plus and the TI Inspire, can deal with function notation. On the TI Inspire, there's a little button right here called the variable button, and right here it says F1. So I'm gonna hit enter on that, and I want to then figure out what each one of these outputs are for a particular input. The calculator knows what's in F1. So for example, if I put zero in right now, it tells me 10, right? It tells me that y-intercept. On the other hand, if I put, oops, not two, but if I put variable F1 of two in, that tells me that the output when the input is two is equal to 2.5. And I can, of course, write that on my sheet. All right. whether you're doing it that way, or whether you're just taking the, the input in, substituting into the function and cranking through, what I'd like you to do is fill out what f of 5 and f of 10 are. f of 10 is going to be a little bit of an ugly decimal, but try to write out all the decimal places. Pause the video now. All right, well really quickly, let's do the remaining two on the calculator as well. I think it's gonna be a nice way to be able to look at them. So f of five is 0 0.3125, and f of 10 is 0 0.009765. I'm gonna bring that back up in a second, but let me just write those numbers out so that we've got them on the big board. 0 0.3125, and I'll write this one down here, 0 0.009765625. All of those decimals aren't really all that important, but I wanted to get them down for the record. Okay, now, let me just bring the calculator back up, because I think it's nice to be able to see the values like this. F of zero is 10, f of 2 is 2.5, f of 3 is 0 0.3125, and f of 10 is that ugly looking decimal. If we look then at the next question, letter B, why are the outputs always decreasing as x increases? Right? We want to think about that. What is it about this function that is making these outputs decrease 
as the input increases. This is important, so let me go back up here. Pause the video now and think about this for a moment. Well, the reason is because the base is less than 1. And when we multiply by a number that is between 0 and 1, right, the base is always positive. When we multiply by a positive number that is less than 1, the result always gets smaller. So let's get that down because it's important. We are multiplying repeatedly. by 0 0.5, which makes the output get smaller. Perhaps one of the most important things that you can understand about all multiplication is that really the dividing line for multiplication is the number 1. When you multiply by a number greater than 1, okay, and we're talking about positive numbers here, not negative numbers. When you multiply by a number greater than 1, the result always gets larger. And when you multiply by a number that is less than 1, such as 0 0.5, the result always gets smaller. All right, let's keep going. Letter C. Why will the outputs never hit 0? Think about the structure of the function. And I've written out the function right there for you again, f of x equals 10 times 0 0.5 to the x. So I claim it doesn't matter whether, even though they're always getting smaller, it doesn't matter whether the input is 10, 100, a million, a trillion. It won't matter. No matter what, the output will never, ever hit zero. Pause the video now and think about that for a moment. Well, believe it or not, it all comes back to what's known as the zero product law, right? The structure of the function itself is a product. It's 10 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5 times 0 0.5, etc., right? And the only way that a product can equal zero, right, is if one part of the product is equal to zero. But, but it's not, right? So the the function is a product and a product only equals zero. <laughs> Red is going to come out whenever it wants to. A product is only equal to zero if one of its factors equals zero, right? Now, granted, it's going to get smaller and smaller, right? It's going to get so small that if we were to weigh it on a scale in pounds, it would probably come out to be equal to zero, but it's not going to be zero. There's just no way. And of course, there's also no way for it ever to be negative because it's the product of a bunch of positive numbers. 10 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5 times 0.5, right? Positive times a positive is a positive. That's another way to r rationalize that it will never be equal to zero because when you multiply a bunch of positive numbers together, you still have a positive number and zero is not positive. Anyhow, let's go down to letter D. Sketch a graph of the function on the axes provided using the window shown. All right, so this is easy enough. What I'd like you to do, we've already put the, the uh, graph into our calculator. What I'd like you to do is get this window on your calculator. I think it goes from negative 1 to 10 along the x-axis and from negative 1 up to 12 along the y-axis and just sketch a quick uh, graph of the function. But, you know, try to be careful about the way that you sketch it. Take a moment to do that. All right. Well, I would like to get that window, even though I already have the function in there. Let's, uh, let's get the same window. I'm going to go over to my graph, menu, window, window settings. Let's see. We've got negative 1 to 10 along the x-axis and negative 1 to 12 along the y-axis. There it is. 
let me move, whoop, that's not what I wanted to do. I just, no, I just want to move, I can't get the equation. All I wanted to do is move the equation. There we go. All right, well, that was, that was a little bit rougher than I thought it was going to be. Anyway, here's our graph, all right? It starts at 10 and it's decreasing as x increases. Now, you might be saying to yourself, well, it hit zero down there. All right, it ran into the x-axis somewhere down there. It didn't. It's getting very close to the x-axis, so close that we can't tell the difference because of the pixel size on our graphing calculator, but it's not actually ever having an input or an output, sorry, of zero. So there's our curve. Great. All right, we've got it sketched. Now, what we say is this exponential function has what is known as a horizontal asymptote of the y-axis or sorry, of the x-axis, which is also the equation y equals zero, right? The x-axis is all the points where y are equal to zero. And we say that this function has a horizontal asymptote there. So let's, let's talk about what horizontal asymptotes are. All right, horizontal asymptotes. A horizontal asymptote is a horizontal line that the function approaches as its input, x value, approaches negative or positive infinity. All right, so in other words, as you go way off to the left or way off to the right, I guess from your perspective it's the opposite, um, if the function starts flattening out and approaching a horizontal line, then we call that horizontal line the function's horizontal asymptote. All right, and they can look a variety of ways. So in the last problem, we saw one that as we headed to positive infinity, the function became uh, came very close to the, the x-axis, or y equals zero. Here's one that as it goes towards negative infinity, it's approaching a horizontal asymptote. You can actually approach horizontal asymptotes in both directions. So for instance, here if I go to positive infinity or negative infinity, I have what's known as a bell curve, and it's approaching that horizontal line. And you can even have more than one horizontal asymptote. You can have two of them. You can't have more than two. All right, but you can have two of them, and here's a good example of a curve, an almost S-shaped curve that is approaching one horizontal line as x goes to positive infinity and a different horizontal line as x goes to negative infinity. So it's got two horizontal asymptotes. All right, so all a horizontal asymptote is, is a horizontal line that the function is getting very close to as x either gets very large in a positive direction or very large in a negative direction. Wow, that was a lot. Okay, let's go to exercise number two. Consider the function g of x equals 10 times 0 0.5 to the x plus 3. Letter A. How would the graph of this function compare to the graph of f of x from exercise number one? Place in your calculator to compare. All right, so what I'm hoping is that you remember some things from algebra one and you can already tell me how this function would compare to this one, but if you're not sure, and you're going to want to do this anyway. Put this in as the second function into your graphing calculator, graph it, and then let's talk about it. All right, well, let's throw it into our own graphing calculator. Let's go for it. I'm going to go menu three. I just got to put in the new function. So that's going to be 10 times 0 0.5 raised to the x plus three. Excellent, and there it is. Oh, had a little bit of an easier time of it there. Now, it might look that in some way we stretched or did something funny to this particular function, but we didn't. In fact, what has happened on this, and let's just bring it up right there, what's happened on this is that at every single different x value, this function has gone up by three units. And it makes sense because literally what we did in each case is we took the output from f, right? We took the output from f, which is this, and we added 3 to it. So what does that do? It just takes all the y values and make them, makes them 3 units larger. So we shifted f of x up three units. And again, that, that should just make all the sense in the world to you. This is f of x, 
right? Those are the outputs to F. So if I just add three to them, then every Y coordinate gets three units larger. All right. Now let's take a look at letter B. What horizontal line will be the horizontal asymptote of this function? Y. Graph it to test. Okay, so in my last problem, right, the x-axis was the horizontal asymptote. So the x-axis was the horizontal asymptote of the original function, f of x. And remember, the x-axis is the equation y equals zero. So what will be the horizontal line for the function g of x equals 10 times 0 0.5 to the x plus three. Pause the video now, and if you think you have it, put it into your graphing calculator as the third function and see what it looks like. All right, well, again, just keep in mind, f of x was equal to 10 times 0 0.5 to the x, and it had the horizontal asymptote y equals zero. g of x, is 10 times 0 0.5 to the x plus 3, so we suspect it's going to have the horizontal asymptote y equals 3. And that's exactly right, and it would look something like that. Right? And what you can see in this particular case is that that, that function, y equals 10 times 0 0.5 to the x plus 3, as x goes towards infinity, this particular curve gets closer and closer and closer to y equals 3, to the point where out here, you can barely tell the difference between the two. Now, if we took a magnifying glass and we zoomed in on that particular section of the graph, we would still see something like this. We would still see it getting closer and closer. There would still be a distance. Now, asymptotes are not actually part of the graph. They're not part of the function. They're sort of a, a wall, or better yet, a floor that the function is getting very close to but never touching. Therefore, asymptotes are almost always drawn in dashed lines, kind of like when you have an inequality and one of the lines isn't actually part of the inequality. So we oftentimes will draw asymptotes as dashed lines, which is why that's the case in this situation. Okay, so let's summarize what we just saw. Vertically shifted exponentials. Horizontal asymptotes of vertically shifted exponential functions. An exponential function that has been vertically shifted such that its formula is y equals a times b to the x plus k has a horizontal asymptote of y equals k. Okay, so here's the point. Any non-vertically shifted uh, exponential function, okay, and it doesn't matter whether the base is greater than one or less than one, that'll just depend on whether or not it's approaching the x-axis in this direction or this direction that will always have the x-axis as its horizontal asymptote. On the other hand, as soon as I add k to it, and of course I could also be subtracting k, then what's going to happen is that that horizontal asymptote is either going to shift upwards or downwards, and y equals k is going to become its new horizontal asymptote. Let's take a look at a very practical example of this next. Cooling liquids. In many real-world problems, when exponential decay occurs, which we saw in, a, uh, in the last lesson, the function approaches a value other than zero as x approaches infinity. A good example of this is when a liquid cools in some stable room temperature, right? So if the room's not, you know, if a, if a liquid is cooling off in a room, if I make my coffee in the morning and it's you know, 190 degrees Fahrenheit, and I set it down in a room that's 70 degrees Fahrenheit, it's gonna cool down, but it's not gonna cool below the 70 degrees Fahrenheit, right? You know, that, that at best is gonna be as cold as it's gonna get. So let's take a look at this. A hot liquid is put in a room that is held at a constant temperature. The Fahrenheit temperature of the liquid, as it cools, can be modeled using the equation f of t equals 124, times one-half to the t divided by three, plus 68, where t represents the time the liquid has been cooling in minutes. Great. So keep in mind, of course, if I covered the 68 up, then what I would have here would be sort of a garden variety decreasing exponential, the base is less than one. Sure, the exponent is t divided by three, but we saw something like that come up in, in half-life problems. So hopefully that doesn't, you know, worry you too much. Anyway, let's take a look at letter A. 
Evaluate f of 0. Give an interpretation of what this value tells you in the context of the problem. And I would suggest right now that you should evaluate f of 0 without using your calculator. Pause the video now. Now I'm betting a few of you probably just said, well, I know. f of 0 is that number. It's 124. But in fact, that's not what f of 0 is equal to. Let's take a look. Right? We can always figure out what f of 0 is by substituting it into the equation. Now, we are going to get 124 to the 1 half to the 0. But that's going to give us 124 plus 68, which is going to give us 192. Right? And that's very critical. So in an unshifted exponential function, unshifted, then this is most certainly the value of the output when the input is equal to zero. The problem here is that we've got your garden variety exponential function that's now been shifted 68 units vertically upwards. And so we end up giving, getting an output, a y-intercept of 192. Now, what is the interpretation of what this value tells you in the context of the problem? Well, keep in mind that f of t is the temperature of the liquid. t represents the time it's been cooling. And so the 192 represents the temperature of the liquid when it begins to cool. All right. So the liquid is at 192 degrees Fahrenheit when it begins to cool. Great. Excellent, excellent. All right, let's take a look at letter B. Graph the function on the axes given for the indicated window. Awesome. So you've got your function. You'll probably want to put it in terms of x. You've got your window. Why don't you go ahead and pause the video right now and draw a general sketch of what this looks like. All right, let's do it. Let me close this out. Let's open up our calculator. I think I'm going to put a, well, actually, yeah, I'm going to put a brand new document in. All right, let's add a graph. F1 of x, we're going to have 124 times 1 half raised to the x divided by 3 plus 68. Make sure that all looks good. It does. Let's now go in and change our window settings. Uh, my window, I don't know. Let me go from negative 1 up to 20. And let me go from, let's say, negative 50 up to 200. Let me move that equation. And there it is. All right, wonderful. Now, you can already see it's starting up here at 192 degrees, although it's a little bit difficult to say exactly where it's starting. It's going downward because the liquid is cooling and it's beginning to level out, right? It's got that horizontal asymptote. So let's just get a sketch of that on the graph. Okay, so we've got our graph. And in fact, maybe I'll even just mark this 192. Right? Why not? It's our starting temperature. Might as well put it on there. Now let's take a look at letter C. Given an equation that represents the horizontal asymptote of this function, graph this on the same set of axes. Okay, so what is the horizontal asymptote? You should be able to just look at this thing and say it's y equals the following. Pause the video now. Well, it's y equals 68. There it is. And it's cool. I love, love, love graphing these things on here. So if I go into uh, menu, function, let's do 68. All right, enter, and there it is. I kind of wish, and I could put it in dashed right now, but I'm going to just keep it solid. And there you see it, right? That function is decreasing, decreasing, decreasing as time goes on. Remember, this is the time the liquid has been cooling in minutes, right up to 20 minutes. It's getting closer and closer to 68 
right? And that's its horizontal asymptote. Okay, and now let's talk about that, letter D. What does the y value of the asymptote tell you in the context of this problem? Now this, this takes a little bit of thought, okay? Um, what I'd like you to do is pause the video right now. While you're thinking about that, I'm going to draw the horizontal asymptote at y equals 68 on our graph. So take a moment right now to think about what that 68 is telling you in the context of this problem. And if you need to, reread re the problem. Take a moment now. Alright, I hope you figured it out. 68 is the constant room temperature, right? It's the temperature of the room in which the coffee, I don't know why I said coffee, why would I say coffee? In which the hot liquid is cooling down. Maybe I've got coffee on my mind. Alright, um, what does it tell you? The temperature of the room. Now, by the way, I would be negligent if I didn't mention the fact that what we're really doing right now, when we model the temperature of a decreasing or, um, or of a cooling liquid in a room or a space that's held at a constant temperature, is something called Newton's Law of Cooling. That's right, Newton came up with this. The guy who studied like the paths of stars and invented calculus and all of that, he was also thinking about the way that liquids cool down, right? And they don't cool down in a linear way, right? They don't like start at a temperature and just go because they can't, right? There's no way that if I've got a house that's 70 degrees and I've got a liquid that's at, let's say, 192 degrees, just below the boiling temperature of water, there's no way that that thing can cool down to be less than the temperature of the room that it's cooling in, right? In fact, in theory, according to Newton, it can't even quite reach that. Now, you might eventually like, you know, put a thermometer into that liquid and say, hey, that's 68 degrees as well, but it's probably just a little bit above 68. Okay, let's take a look at letter E. What does the value 124 in the function represent? Illustrate this quantity on the graph. Now this might be the most challenging thing of all, right? We now know that the 68 represents the, represents the room temperature, right? We know that the temperature at the beginning was 192, but what does that 124 represent? See if you can figure that out by pausing the video and considering. Well, the 124, keep in mind, is what we added on to the 68 in order to get up to 192, right? We literally added that 124 onto the 68 to get the 192, okay? So what the 124 represents is the original difference between the temperature of the liquid and the temperature of the room, right? So it's the original difference between the liquid temp and room temp. And it's that difference, what's called a temperature gradient, it's that difference between the temperature of the liquid and the temperature of the room that is driving the cooling. All right. The higher that temperature difference is, the faster it cools. And the smaller that temperature is, the slower it cools. Until eventually, when those differences are so small between the temperature of the liquid and the temperature of the room, there's hardly any cooling going on at all. Anyhow, let's take a look at letter F. Given letter D, how can you interpret the expression 1 half to the t divided by 3 within the context of the problem? Cool, right? So now we're taking this 124 and we're multiplying it by 1 half to the t over 3. And keep in mind, right, that the t represents the number of minutes that the liquid has been cooling. 
So what I'd like you to do is think about this, and I'm really hoping you saw our lesson on, on half-life and radioactive decay, or that included those two, because that's going to help you a lot here. Pause the video now. Well, what it tells us is that every three minutes, the difference between the liquid temperature and the room temperature goes down by a half, right? We keep getting to multiply this number by a half every three minutes. And so that difference every three minutes goes down by a half. So originally that difference is 124 degrees Fahrenheit. And after three minutes, it goes down to 62 degrees Fahrenheit. And after six minutes, it goes down to 31 degrees Fahrenheit. And after that, I can't even divide by two anymore. So, you know, why would I? Anyway, so every three minutes, the difference between the liquid and room temp room temps is cut in half. Right? It's like radioactive decay, except with radioactive decay you're always heading to zero. In this case we're heading to the room temperature of 68. Because we're not decreasing the room temperature at all, we're just decreasing the difference between the room temperature and the liquid temperature. All right, letter G, it's like the problem that never ends. Letter G, rewrite the expression 1 half to the t over 3 in the form of b to the t. Round b to the nearest thousandth. What does this tell you in the context of the problem? Awesome. Well, we did this repeatedly both when we were working with radioactive decay and when we were working with compound interest problems. So see if you can rewrite this funny expression so that it no longer looks like one half to the t over three, but it looks like some kind of base just raised to the t. Pause the video now and go ahead and do that. All right. Well, we can say using the product property of exponents, that one half to the t over three is the same as one half to the one third all raised to the t, right? So one half to the t over three, which is one third times t, we can bring that one third inside, leave the t out, and now we're looking for the cubed root of one half, right? The cubed root of one half, which of course we can do that on our calculator pretty easily. Um, let me just add a calculator page and if I put in one half to the one third, I end up getting 0 0.7937. And I want to round that to the nearest thousandth. So let me put my calculator array, go back in here, whoop, full screen, and all of this is going to be 0 0.794 to the t. Now, the problem also then asks us to then interpret this, right? So we have on one interpretation of the model when it's in this form, right, which says that the difference between the, temp the two temperatures is decreasing by one half every three minutes. What does this tell you? Pause the video again and see if you can answer that. Well, this tells us that every minute, every minute, the difference between the two temperatures is 79.4% of what it was before. So we can now say, let me extend this, if I do one, let's say, minus 0.794, that gives me point. 206, and that's actually the more important number. What that says is that every minute the difference, again, it's the difference between the two temperatures, the difference between the two temps decreases, uh, increases. <laughs> by 
right? So by writing it in that form, we are able to talk about the percent decrease per minute versus let's say the temperature difference going down by a half every three minutes, all right? You've seen this manipulation so often that I hope that it's, it's like almost become automatic. Let's look at the last part of this problem. The liquid needs to cool to a temperature of 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Determine the time to the nearest tenth of a minute when this temperature will be reached. All right, well, let's see if you can figure that out. All right, this is easy enough. All we have to do is go into our calculator. Let's head back to our graph. Let's go into our menu. Let's enter a function of 80. Okay, once we have that here, just move that off. All I need to do now is find the intersection of this function and this function. So I'm going to go into menu and I'm going to analyze my graph. I'm going to do my intersection um, uh, and my second graph. There we go. Lower bound, enter. Upper bound, enter. It's a little bit trickier when you have, whoops, oh, that's not what I wanted, but that's okay. Just want to move that point so that you can see it a little bit better. <laughs> I managed to move my horizontal asymptote like completely and utterly away. It's a little bit harder when you've got um, two, three curves to find the intersection because you have to pick your first curve and your second curve. But when I did, what I found was 10.11 comma 80, and that tells me to the nearest tenth of a minute, right? So I just graphed 80 on here. I want to throw that onto my graph. 10.11 comma 80. So after 10.11, one minutes, the liquid has cooled to what I want. All right, great. Let's wrap this up. Got way deeper into Newton's law of cooling than I thought we were going to, but hey, you got to love it. So today what we did is we looked at what are called horizontal asymptotes. And you'll actually even hear in the world, real world people saying things like that's an asymptotic process or it's got an asymptote of this or that or whatever. Now, most of the time in realistic or real world scenarios, what we're always talking about is that as X heads off to infinity, basically the outputs of a given function, and in this case it's an exponential function, are getting very, very close to a constant value. All right. Now, a constant Y value is a horizontal line. So all naturally unshifted exponential functions have the x-axis or y equals zero as their horizontal asymptote. On the other hand, if you add a constant to an exponential function, which will shift it vertically up or down, depending on whether you add a positive or a negative constant, that will also shift the horizontal asymptote in the same direction. So as we saw, if we add three to a, an exponential function, all of a sudden it will have a horizontal asymptote of y equals three. If we subtracted eight from an exponential function, it would have a horizontal asymptote of y equals negative eight. You'll see horizontal asymptotes a lot in future math courses, and we'll see them a little bit more in this particular course, and we'll also see their counterpart, the vertical asymptote. For now, I just want to thank you for joining me for another Algebra 2 lesson by eMath Instruction. My name is Kirk Weiler, and until I see you again, keep thinking and keep solving problems.